Um, great, so we're uh, really excited to start the second week, and we have uh, some new ones. Um, so let's start today with Matt, who's going to tell us about new ideas for the week's go. Okay, no, great. Uh, thanks, Yonit, and um, uh, thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me to be here. It's always a pleasure to be back. I've spent my last few years at CERN, where all of the architecture is, a, is pretty grim, and it's about 50 or 60 years old, and then I moved to Cambridge, where it's not uncommon to be sat in a 500-year-old building, and then coming here, uh, things uh, stretch back much further, so, so uh, uh, it's given me food for thought already. Um, so I'm s I was asked to talk about new ideas for the weak scale. So uh, essentially this will be the hierarchy problem. And this is a problem that um, has been a, a dominant theme in, in particle physics for, for decades. Um, and I, th I, I believe it will continue to be a, a dominant, or at least a very important theme in particle physics in the coming decades. Um, and it's something that I, 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 I uh, continually uh, think about. It keeps me up at night. Um, so I'm going to start today by talking about some old ideas, first of all, discussing um, the origins of the hierarchy problem the way I see it. And then we'll go on to discuss um, uh, some older ideas that have been fleshed out really in the last uh, few decades uh, to really set the scene for the next two lectures, which will really discuss uh, novel approaches. But I, I believe it's impossible for, for you to, to understand the motivation for novel approach, for the more new approaches um, uh, without uh, having some idea for, for, for some of the older topics or approaches to the hierarchy problem. Um, but first, before, before I, I begin, um, I would uh, uh, appreciate it if, if uh, and be very glad if you interrupt me and ask stupid questions. I'm very much of the school of thought that there's no such thing as a stupid question, only a stupid answer. So if you feel like I haven't explained something well enough, uh, please just, just butt in and shout at me. I, I much prefer that than, than, than waiting till the end of the lecture uh, to, to uh, go through these things. And I guarantee if you haven't understood something, then someone else in the, under, in the, in the room will probably have not understood the same thing or if, it's, if you don't feel it's been explained clearly. Um, so you'll be doing a service for everyone if you just shout out, even if I, you know, don't put your hand up or anything like that, just shout at me. And to get a sense of, of, of who I'm talking to, can I ask who has heard of Goldstone's theorem? in this room. Okay, who understands Goldstone's theorem? Okay, good, excellent. That's, uh, that's perfect, I think, uh, I think my, 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 my expectation for, for, for the background. All <laughs> <laughs> um, oh right. Does he still turn up? Did you see him when you were at Harvard? Um, Okay, so, so I'm going to start by discussing effective field theory. Now, you have dedicated lectures on effective field theory starting this afternoon, um, but it's absolutely impossible for me to discuss uh, the hierarchy problem this morning without c covering some basics, but it's going to be super, super uh, uh, um, uh, low-level stuff. No technicalities, more almost philosophical. And the, 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 the notion of, of effective field theory is really to do with um, uh, uh, length scales, physics at different length scales. It's really the... Uh, only sensible way to factorize the physics, uh, uh, the relevant physics at different length scales um, uh, when approaching a problem. And you, I, I, I will try and explain this uh, by uh, uh, thinking about something that will have a sort of chronological aspect to it, but it's not really a chronological aspect. The only reason that there's any sort of timeline in, in the pictures that I'm going to draw here is just because um, humanity was just building better and better microscopes and that took time. Um, it's really the, the time axis is the same as the distance scale axis as we go to smaller and smaller distances. So if you were, uh, you know, working with, with atoms over 100 years ago, you would scatter light off something that, that appears to you to be essentially like a neutral ball. The light would interact with this neutral ball um, uh, through things like dipole moments and so on. So you would observe that... This, this thing isn't just a totally neutral ball, otherwise the, 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 the photon would not have interacted with it. Um, <coughs> but you also see that it doesn't have the leading interaction of a photon that you would have if, if the, the ball were, uh, 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 the sphere, let's call it, were, were charged. And those dipole interactions tell you that there's some sort of charge distribution within the atom. But until you build a microscope to go within the atom, to, to work at length scales, um, below the, the size of the atom, you would not be able to tell precisely what that substructure was. You could measure some, some dipole moments, so you know there's something going on in there. But all you can do is guess as to what is going on. And this is essentially uh, uh, what happens. So if we have a microscope with, that's probing physics on length scales like, uh, wavelengths like this, 
and we just see atoms and we can start to guess about what's going on. Then you build a, a better microscope where essentially your photons have wavelengths smaller than the, the size of the atom and you see that actually there's substructure as you expected and it looks like an electron um, orbiting a nucleus, some sort of nucleus, let's call it M. So now let's say our microscope has wavelengths uh, uh, like this. So we started to discover what the substructure was. So here we had some dipole moments and things like that. Um, in effective field theory language, you would, you would understand them as being like uh, uh, higher dimension operators, just some sort of interaction with the photon. You don't know what, where it came from, but then when you build a better microscope and you go to shorter distance, le distance lengths, you see that actually there's some st substructure going on. Then you build a better microscope. You know, now we're, we're, we're shooting ahead towards the sort of the nuclear era. And our bigger microscope works on much smaller wavelengths. And you can resolve that then there's not just a, a nucleus, but actually this nucleus is made up of neutrons and protons. And actually, once you start to smash these things apart um, on similar uh, uh, length scales, you see that there are, are pions as well. And again, the nuclear physicists who were doing things like the shell model and all that sort of stuff, uh, liquid drop model, um, uh, didn't know they were working with an effective field theory where they, they were essentially discussing, discussing the nucleus and trying to guess at, what was going, would have, w w guess at what was going on. Of course, the people who were doing those empirical models knew already that there were neutrons and protons, but they couldn't derive why they were interacting in the, in, in, in the way they were. So you can do some empirical physics here uh, with the nucleus, but, um, uh, uh, some, uh, but to, to really understand what's going on, you need to go to a more sort of microscopic level. And then as we go further uh, into the future, I'll maybe skip a few steps here. We build an even better microscope where we see that actually, if we zoom in on, uh, on one of these uh, uh, protons or neutrons, you see there's all sorts of stuff going on. There's gluons, Higgs bosons, W bosons, Z bosons, and all sorts of things. <coughs> and then as we go to the future, uh, 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 we don't know what comes next. So here our microscope is you know, at order LHC uh, wavelength, so uh, very, very short wavelengths. So this, is, this sort of looks chronological, right? This is almost like the history. It's not quite because steps here were superseding steps there and so, so on. And, and similarly here, we were able to guess certain features. But, but, um, but, it, but it all came about because we were building better and better microscopes, going to shorter and shorter uh, 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 distance scales. And in each step, we, ha we are working with an effective field theory. And that effective field theory um, can contain uh, uh, different degrees of freedom, different fields and particles than the previous step did. So here, if you're working at these energies, it makes absolutely no sense to talk about um, the nucleus it, uh, uh, because you're, you're working at distance, at energy scales and distance scales, um, which are not relevant for uh, uh, the length scale of the nucleus. So it doesn't make sense. And similarly, it would, would be crazy, although you can do it, it would be crazy to try and derive, although people are actually doing it, derive nuclear physics in terms of, of the physics of the Higgs boson and the Z boson and so on. So at each step in this, uh, in this chain of effective field theories, we're working with different degrees of freedom, different fields and particles. Um, but there's a sense in which we can calculate, because as we go from here to here, um, you can flow in this direction and derive the, the physics at longer distance scales in principle. And we can really do that, for example, on the lattice. We can take um, uh, uh, the quarks and the gluons and we can derive the properties to a certain extent with, comp with limitations that are purely our own and computational. We can derive the properties of protons and neutrons and pions and so on. And we can take uh, the interactions of protons and neutrons and pions and understand the physics of, of uh, nuclear structure and derive the properties of nuclei. And uh, similarly, you can take the, the, the uh, microscopic model here of an electron and a nucleus with some spins and derive the pro properties of atoms. So there's a sense in which we have calculability. We can go from one step, uh, uh, from one side on the right to, to uh, longer distance scales. And this is really, uh, we, we call this, um, uh, the, the sort of terminology here when we're discussing about these steps is really RG flow, renormalization group flow. But it's the idea that you can take a, f a theory that's, that uh, describes physics on some distance scale and then coarse grain over uh, longer distance scales to give you the relevant physics at longer distance scales. This is in some sense, we, we might call this, I'll use this term, I'm putting this in here, not strictly uh, uh, adhering to any st 
uh, sort of uh, uh, strict definitions, but I will refer to this sort of uh, process of moving from, from shorter distance scales to, to longer distance scales as, as Wilsonian flow uh, at various stages in these lectures. Now, you may say, well, what about going in the other direction? Can we derive the physics um, of the nucleus and the electron from this step? And the answer is no, not un unambiguously. Because there are many different theories that could flow to this theory. And you can, by, by measuring more and more operators within this theory, you can start to get ideas about what the next step can be. But you cannot unambiguously uh, determine what's happening on short distance scales. Um, and this is, this is uh, um, uh, related to the concept of universality. So who, who, who's heard of universality in sort of Excellent, fantastic. So this is related to the concept of universality, that there are many different microscopic theories that can land you in the same effective field theory. So, <coughs> and, and what that means is that it's very hard to go in this direction. Really, the only way to unambiguously go in this direction is experiment. Just to go build a microscope and see what's there. Otherwise, um, you're flummoxed. To a certain extent, you can always um, uh, hire or hire a bunch of smart people or maybe in the future, uh, a bunch of supercomputers to make educated guesses about what's going on. And we've seen this many, many, many times. So, for example, um, with, in, for example uh, uh, with the Fermi operator, which allows the muon to decay to a neutrino, an electron, and, and a neutrino, um, we could guess, n not unambiguously, but we could guess at the sorts of UV completions, the sort of microscopic theories that could have given rise to that interaction involving the W and Z boson, long before we knew the W and Z boson existed. Now that was not unambiguous. We had one interaction and we knew that there are many different theories that could have given us that interaction, but we could sort of um, uh, uh, guess at uh, the structure of, of those theories and write down different ones. And some guys, uh, uh, Glashow, Solomon, Weinberg in particular, guessed the right symmetry structure. There, it could have been, there could have been other symmetry structures that in, in, in the microscopic theory that led to that operator. Um, <coughs> But they were able to, to jump the gun, essentially, long before the W and Z were, were, were discovered and, and, and make an educated guess that helped going in this direction. So I'll do like a, a dotted line. Theory guesses. And this is also true in other places as well. So for example, um, from the structure of, of the pions and the kaons and baryons, um, very, very clever people were able to make educated guesses about this, the, the, the um, uh, uh, symmetry structure of uh, the quarks and of QCD. Okay? So we can make theory guesses, but we don't ever know uh, unless we build experiments. So the experiment will always be the, uh, the solid line. Now we're at a situation where we, actually, I should put this over here where we have no idea, I'm going to go in this direction now, we have no idea what comes next. Um, the only way to unambiguously know is experiment. Or to make educated guesses. And that's essentially what uh, the paradigm of the hierarchy problem has been. Um, it's sometimes phrased in very different language, but this is, this is the way I see it. I think, and I think the historical perspective is very, very important to keep in mind. You know, when we um, uh, uh, think about effective field theories at any energy scale, we should be um, careful not to um, overestimate our knowledge in the sense that uh, the, the theoretical pro pro progress has always been a step of, of f discovering the right and relevant degrees of freedom at or fields or particles at a given energy scale. And, and uh, then making educated guesses plus building experiments to find out what comes next. If you don't do that, you don't know. Um, so sometimes when we, when we look at the standard model, we can say, oh, well, standard model is working extremely well. It's matching all of our experiments. So maybe that's all there is and we can just uh, uh, leave it at that. But historically, there's no, uh, um, well, there's many, many problems with that approach, which I will, I will discuss later. But historically, there's really no precedent to think that any given moment in time was, was, was uh, necessarily a super special one. If we had stopped here, you know, at the, say we just had pions and, and, and kaons and things like this, and never built an experiment to probe distance scales less than a, a GeV, we just would not know what comes next. We would never have known. And, and we're sort of in that situation now with the weak scale. We've probed the energy scales of the weak, uh, around the weak scale, 
to increasing precision. And uh, so we've discovered the Higgs boson. So we know um, not the dynamics, but we know at least um, the, 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 the symmetry structure of electroweak symmetry breaking and now uh, the mechanism of electroweak symmetry uh, break breaking, which is perturbative. Um, but to go to shorter distance scales, we really need to build experiment or uh, have some good uh, theoretical guesses for, for what's going on. Okay, so this is sort of my, my, my sales pitch for, for uh, uh, how to think about the, the standard model and in, 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 uh, the way I see it. I should say that also, like, um, normally at each step, when we start to discover the next set of relevant particles or fields at any given energy scale, um, thanks to this Wilsonian logic of, of flowing to the left, you, uh, at that given energy scale, once you've just accessed that energy scale, you only really measure the most relevant operators and interactions. So there are ones that um, become more and more irrelevant as you flow to the left. And what that means is that when you sort of get to that next stage, you expect to discover the most relevant operators um, at that energy scale. And you could, s w on one side, you could say, well, the standard model is renormalizable because you like, you know, to put in counter terms and, and, uh, and uh, calculate loops and absorb everything into your measured quantities, and that's great. Um, but it's also not surprising that now that we're at the stage where we've discovered all of the particles of the standard model, that we are, have only measured a set of renormalizable interactions because they would be the first things that you measure. You don't expect necessarily um, uh, to start to access higher dimension, higher dimension operators which, would, which are irrelevant and uh, would not necessarily uh, signal the presence of physics beyond the standard model um, at the outset. However, we're sort of now at the threshold. If, if there's some new level beyond the standard model, new level of physics, where the relevant degrees of freedom at our current energy scale are just the standard model particles, we should start to see evidence of whatever that new microscopic level of physics is uh, soon. So I, I'm, on, I'm on the fence. I, I don't, personally, I don't think the fact that the standard model is renormalizable uh, is, is any special thing. If you took, for example, the theory of just the pions, and wrote down their kinetic terms and electromagnetic interactions and their masses, you would say, well, this is a renormalizable theory. It's only when you discover um, higher, higher order interactions that you start to, to tease out the, the physics of the UV completion. So I, I don't think the fact that we've measured a renormalizable theory at this time should concern anybody. That's exactly what you expect. Historically, that's exactly what you expect, unless there's some special symmetry uh, uh, breaking s uh, situations where you get the higher dimension operators very quickly, like the Fermi uh, interaction for leptons, for example, in beyond decay. Okay, so that's, are there any questions about any of this? Uh, this is sort of super vague, but I want to paint a picture of, of historical context and the difference between uh, uh, theoretical guesses and actually just knowing, which is uh, performing an experiment. Yes. So when we have the, even just knowing that the proton existed, we knew that the Z factor for the proton was not 2. So well before we got to the GV scale, we knew the proton was some big factor from Yes. Even if we didn't know what it was. Yes. And then you talked about the story with the pion. What's special about, the, about uh, where we are now is that we, we apart from physics at, at the Planck scale, we don't have a direct indication of where the, of uh, some other scale. Yes. Uh, that there's something new happening. Yes. Happening. Yes. yes. But the fact that, um, well, for G is a slightly different story, but the fact, but with, with the pions, I mean, um, the reason that, that we were seeing, so I totally agree. So, so, so what Neem is saying is that, that the standard model, this, this historical moment is special because, because at present we have no indication of, of uh, any new uh, high energy physics scale just around the corner, the th the th the th whereas for the other examples I gave, there, there was. And indeed, that was the case, I mean, immediately with atoms, right, dipole moments, straight bang, uh, that first thing you measure is evidence for an, an energy scale. Absolutely. Um, however, uh, we, it may be that we're, that thanks to the structure of the standard model of this EFT that we're living in at the minute, um, uh, that will come. So for example, the, the reason that the pion, the energy scale, for example, in pion, pion interactions was, came straight out, out of the back, 
but it's, it's, we didn't have a huge scale separation in the first place, right? So, so by the time you're measuring the, the relevant degrees of freedom of the EFT, you're already measuring the, the dipole, up, you know, the, the, the higher... I, I agree that if we only had the pion, if we only had pion, then you'd have to do some pretty tough measurement to discover the pion scattering right. and that would give you the scale. Exactly. Just that we have the proton. Yes. So the, 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 the proton is a relic from the UV. It yes. happens to be stable and we're... Exactly, but this is the point. Sy symmetries... So, so, but because of that, we knew about the yes. scale so, so, so somewhat indirectly, we knew about that. Exactly. Uh, the, the act, uh, you know, the accident of baryon number <laughs> conservation yeah. helped us. Right. So here, you know, here, we had energy, we, we immediately got it just because the first yeah, interaction. Well, if someone discovers a magnetic monopole, then immediately we have access to the gas scale. Yes. Right? Just because we have this yeah. very massive particle that's yeah. sitting around. Yeah. So that's, that's another way to get access without yes. an accelerator. Yes, exactly. Relic. So, so yes. But you see, we could be in a situation, so this is sort of why, why I'm pushing on this. We could be in a situation now where it's like we don't have the proton and we've just discovered the pions and now we need to figure out what's going on. And we need to get to F pi and we haven't got there yet. So for me, it's not, for me, there's no current catastrophe. In our EFT, we haven't been handed uh, some nice stable remnant or something like this or some, you know, we haven't seen CP violation. Yeah, I just want to say that yeah. it is a, it's, a, it's not a physics, it's a historical Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, you could say, you could ask the question, because I, I think the situation we're in is almost quite generic. Whereas you could say, why were we, were we so lucky in the past? Why were we given all these free balls, right? Uh, step after step. Um, OK, excellent. Um, and there, so this isn't also, I just want to comment that this is not just a, a particle physics uh, story. This is this, this steps, these steps of hierarchies of EFTs in some form or another have been around for a long time. You know, one, one example which isn't totally analogous to this, would be new Newtonian gravity from general relativity. You know, we had Newtonian gravity and it was working super duper well and we had some observations that were sort of not stacking up. They were essentially giving us evidence in this language of, of higher, in higher order interactions. This were things like the perihelion of, of, of Mercury, for example. And then uh, a, s a set of very smart theory guesses at what's coming next um, really... Uh, 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 opened up the next the next uh, uh, chapter in gravitational physics. Of course, no new degrees of freedom were really discovered there. Um, in a sense, the, the effective field theory we were working with at the time didn't really understand what the degree of freedom was. Um, this also happens in condensed matter physics. You know, the, the, the Landau-Ginsberg theory of superconductivity was some s super effective, uh, effective theory. Um, and, um, and it was just an empirical model where you just had some dumb scalar field uh, uh, that was charged. And it con condenses in the superconductor and essentially in, uh, uh, spontaneously breaks one of what we would call the gauge symmetries at that time. And um, then it was only when BCS went ahead and said, well, what is this dumb scalar field? Where is it coming from? And they realized that, that uh, 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 electrons were essentially pairing together through uh, an attractive force that came about because of interactions with phonons. And, and uh, the, the scalar field was related to the, the condensate or the pairs of, of electrons. And this was exactly like this. There was some dumb effective field theory stage, which was like the, the, the Landau-Ginsberg theory. And then the, the UV completion, the microscopic theory, uh, was BCS. Um, it's come a, uh, uh, this comes around time and time again. So, um, and I, I believe at the moment there's no special reason to think, apart from uh, the fact that we don't have uh, hints from experiment yet, that we're necessarily in a, in a different uh, situation. Okay, so now to, to make this all a little bit more, more quantitative, how do we make these theory guesses? And I was saying we make theory guesses and we've had a lot of success in the past of jumping the gun, beating experiment, um, by staring at the EFT we're working with at the time and making an educated guess. And there's many ways uh, you could do this. I'm not going to go through the entire history of particle physics. But I want to talk about a guess that we could have made had we just discovered the pions and we didn't have the proton around. Uh, where's the wiper? Oh. Um, one one uh, guess we could have made um, if we were living at this stage here, where there's uh, a new, uh, just the pions. Say, say we built an accelerator that could only scatter particles at energies around hundreds of MeV, but not uh, GeVs. Then um, 
we've been in a situation where we had uh, the pions and um, essentially nothing else. So you would discover the pions and uh, you can study the effective theory of these pions and try and guess at, at what is going on. And there's a guess that, I, that wasn't really made at the time, but we could have made that would have helped um, in unraveling what was going to happen next. Thankfully, we just had experiments at the same time that we knew there were pions. Essentially, uh, we had experiments going to much higher energy. So this guess didn't have to be made. But we're in a situation now where we, we, we uh, uh, face an analogous situation uh, in the sense that we have discovered some scalar fields we're studying their, their properties, so there's the, the Higgs boson, but there's also the, the longitudinal components, essentially, of, of the Ws and Zs. And we're trying to, to, to guess at, at what comes next. Sadly, though, we don't have an experiment operating at many, many tens of TeV, so we can't uh, fully unravel everything, but we can, we can make guesses. So for the pi zero, if we were uh, in this sort of hypothetical situation where we had just discovered pions, our accelerator energy didn't go above, say, 300 MeV, We'd maybe uh, 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 not even, you know, we hadn't seen the rho meson or anything like this. Then we'd say, well, look, there's a scalar. It's neutral, the pi zero. Um, and, and it has mass. And then there's also a charge scalar, uh, which couples to the photon. And we can study the possible symmetries we could have here. So here, the kinetic term is just uh, d pi zero squared you know, with, one, with a one half. But here we have um, uh, a kinetic term uh, which looks like this. And what we've discovered is that these guys are the relevant degrees of freedom at, at this energy scale. But, um, and clearly because they're the only ones, they are lighter than all the other uh, uh, degrees of freedom in this theory which are at higher energy scales which we have not accessed yet at, at a collider. But they also uh, appear to be quite close in mass, right? So there's a, a mass term here. Um, there's a mass term here. But we can understand that this mass can be small because if this mass were set to zero, this theory would have um, a shift symmetry. which is um, that pi zero goes to pi zero plus some constant, let's call it kappa. So we can understand that the, the pion can actually be um, much lighter than the, the other degrees of freedom because there could be a, a symmetry in the effective theory, which is a shift symmetry, which um, allows the, the, the pion to be, to be massless. And then that means that if we have some small breaking of that, that symmetry, um, the, the mass of the pion is, is, uh, uh, can be understood to be light because the, the, there's no reason for, if there's just one parameter in the theory that breaks that symmetry, there's no reason for having large corrections, for example, to the pion mass. That's the, the symmetry in the effective field theory. What it tells us is that there should be some sort of symmetry, not necessarily a shift symmetry, but some sort of, shift sim some sort of symmetry uh, uh, in the UV theory, in the microscopic theory. Um, which gives rise to this uh, approximate shift symmetry in the IR theory. Now we look at the charge pion, and it's sort of a similar uh, story, um, where uh, if we set this guy to zero, then thanks to this term here, we would have a shift symmetry, so we can understand why the, the charge pion is light. But there's also this coupling to the photon, which breaks the shift symmetry. If, w if I uh, do a shift on the charge pion like this in here, uh, this term will no longer be invariant. So we have a little bit of evidence. We have something to work with here, which is that in terms of, um, in terms of the effective field theory degrees of freedom, there's a difference. The charged pion is not like the neutral pion. So we have, this is, this is a, if we were living in this hypothetical universe where we just discovered the pions um, and uh, never gone to higher energies, we have this little, uh, a little piece of information dangled down from the, 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 the microscopic theory telling us that these two, these two particles are not the same. Um, and it tells us that in general, we should expect in the effective field theory, there's a there's sort of a, a, a vague principle, which is that everything which is not forbidden is compulsory in an effective field theory, which is more the notion of um, 
uh, uh, given the apparent symmetries that you see within the effective field theory, uh, you should expect to have every operator that's consistent with those, those symmetries. You, you don't, that doesn't necessarily mean you know the, the, the specific coefficient of that operator, but um, uh, you expect heuristically, essentially, to, to uh, 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 see all of the operators generated in the effective field theory, which are consistent with the symmetries of that theory. And this is something that's borne out in physics. This is not um, some aesthetic concern or something like that. It's just um, a, a, a fact that from this Wilsonian flow, essentially, that whatever the microscopic theory was, is if you flow, if you have a certain number of symmetries in the, the microscopic theory and you flow to the IR, to the, the effective field theory that you've discovered, then um, you don't expect to see anything special happening beyond what uh, those symmetries dictate. And what we see then is that there's no reasons, because this guy here is breaking a shift symmetry, we have no reason to believe that the charge pion mass, I'm going to do mass squared differences between the charge pion mass squared and the, the neutral pion mass squared, um, should be, they could be uh, sort of the same essentially. Let's say, say we expect them to be sort of zero because um, uh, apart from this thing here, they sort of look identical. They're just, yep. Well, yes, excellent. We'll come back to that. Yep, that's a very important point. Yep. Ah, because at that fixed point, you're still interacting with the photon? Yes, but, but if you're going to point, I think the carbon goes to zero, right? Uh, I mean, it's okay, well, you don't, the, so, 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 yes, okay, so, um, we're not, so, so, we're, we're working with, with really the pions that we've discovered, so they're, you know, the, the, the physical pions that we've discovered. By the time, you know, by the, so, if, so, so if you were to go below the energy scale of the pions, then you just have the photon and you have nothing. But we're really working at the energy scale of the pions, so there is, there is this coupling, it has not gone to zero. And D, so, so the, the photon lives the whole way through, for the pions, the photon lives the whole way through the Gaussian fixed point and then out the bottom because where, where you've integrated them out. Um, so you can, you can imagine that maybe we can believe from the effective theory that these pions would have the same mass squared, except for the fact that there's this guy here which is breaking the symmetry, uh, 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 which treats these guys like those guys here. So there's nothing to forbid something like corrections to the mass splitting, which are going like uh, E squared. This is on dimensional grounds. If you put H bar back in the action, you see that this has to be E squared uh, over something like 4 pi squared. And um, the, uh, uh, the physics, the, the, the um, f energy scale of the new physics at, uh, at the cutoff in the next stage. So say we're working here and we're trying to guess what's coming next, uh, going towards the QCD scale. So there's nothing to forbid cor corrections like this. Now that doesn't mean that, uh, that you can, from this theory, tell what, what the numer precise numerical coefficient is here, but there's just no symmetry reason that you shouldn't have some sort of mass splitting between the, those guys. Yep? Wouldn't you be able to say that about <laughs> literally any meson? I mean, because all mesons, I mean, if you just write, write a scalar, right, and it would look exactly the same as what you said about them. Right. Also, Rome and the Rome and the Rome. What, what's special about the pions here? Nothing. I mean, so, so, so you, at, any, at any energy scale, you can look at the structure of the interactions and start to make guesses about what happens at higher energies. So, so why isn't the eta meson the same mass? Because we haven't discovered it yet. Ah. Well, but isn't the reason we discovered this is that their masses are fairly clo close? I mean. well, so these are just the lightest guys. So we built an accelerator that's just gone to the pion mass and, and just a little bit above. And we're trying to guess what comes next. Now, historically, that's not what happened. Sure, but if we just discovered the three pions, why would we think these three pions are related to each other? You, you, you ah, well, we think because, no, exactly. exactly. So, so we would think, at first, we'd think, well, well, apart from the interaction with the photon, they're related because they all essentially have the same mass. It's like 5 MeV mass splitting. So it sort of looks like there's some symmetry. So there's two degrees of freedom in here and one in here. So it looks sort of like nature's telling us there's some sort of SO3 or SU2 symmetry playing around in here. So you sort of think, well, these guys look like they're related. But then you would look at this and say, well, but actually they're not the same because one's charged and this guy is not. 
So they, 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 they must be different in some way. And this is essentially the, the equation formulation of that statement, that there's some difference between these guys, which means their mass cannot be, be identical. Yep. Yes. Yes. But how do we know that it is marginally relevant? I mean, relevant, when you say relevant, uh, you are relevant with respect to the IR. Yes. So, but we're not even flowing. We're just doing, ah. we're just scattering these pions at just above their mass and looking at how they interact with them. And we've measured that, uh, that coupling at some energy scale. We're not even flowing. I mean, it's, 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 uh, we've, we've discovered the pions. There's a neutral one and a charged one. And now we're trying to make guesses about what comes next. Uh, yes, exactly. So, exactly. So, we've got a scalar, it's got a mass, and we're trying to, to discover, to, to figure out what comes next. These are great questions, by the way. Okay. So, we're trying to figure out what comes next, but there's nothing to forbid this. So, if, there's some, if there is some new physics skill beyond just the pions, then there's nothing to forbid uh, corrections like this. And so, there, so what then, but then we see that, that m pi plus uh, the charged pion mass minus the, the neutral pion mass is uh, about a 5 MeV mass splitting. So something is going on. It's telling us um, <coughs> that there are essentially, as far as I can tell, to a first approximation, three possibilities. There is that um, lambda squared is, so if putting in this factor here, that 5 MeV mass splitting comes about if, you, if this guy's around, I think, 750 MeV. So if this is much, much larger than 750 MeV uh, squared, so that there, there, are, uh, uh, there is a new physics scale, but it's a long, long way away. But somehow there's just been some accident where there's some uh, 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 bare mass term, let's call this plus uh, m pi plus minus squared bare. I'll, I'll give it a, a bar. There's some uh, uh, bare mass term. Um, for the charged pion and for the, 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 the neutral pion. This is sort of in the context of a sort of Peskin and Schroeder, Schroeder style language. But what this really means is that in the microscopic theory, there's some contribution to the, to the, to the uh, masses of these guys, which has just been tuned such that this mass difference exactly cancels this mass difference, so that we've just, in the, the, the effective field theory, we've just got some accident um, happening uh, uh, um, to exactly cancel this guy off. So there's some magic happening in the next microscopic layer where there's some contributions to the masses that exactly cancel uh, uh, this sort of contribution. There's also the possibility that, that lambda squared is less than or around 750 MeV. But what that's telling us is that we've got a boon for, for experimental physics because um, something has to show up if this is the case. We've just discovered our pions and there has to be something uh, just around the corner. Or uh, um, another possibility is that the pion uh, masses are, are not calculable in the first place. Which means that you're not, there is no next layer where, we, where you can do this step. Okay? It's saying that there's, there's nothing else and it's unphysical to even ask why the pion mass is what it is. So this is a really, really radical possibility, right? This says, this would say the end of physics. Um, now what, what actually happened? Well, well, this is what happened. This is the, the story that nature picked. Um, and indeed, what showed up just around the corner was, um, uh, oh, sorry, I've lost a page here, was that their new physics showed up. It was the, the Rho meson and all of the other mesons. And uh, <coughs> these corrections are actually there. You can, I'm not going to uh, show you the calculation, but uh, these, these um, corrections actually do, do show up. There is a contribution from the microscopic theory um, where you have the rho meson and things like this, and you can calculate it, and it turns out it pretty much exactly matches the mass difference. So this, this idea of flowing from the left to the right works beautifully. You have the microscopic theory, which now has things like the rho meson and so on, and you take that microscopic theory and you just go ahead and calculate um, uh, the, the properties at, the, at longer distances, and you get a calculable correction to the, the pion masses, um, which exactly matches... Uh, matches uh, uh, the measured value, or pretty much. Now, for the hierarchy problem, we're actually, for the Higgs sector, it's not all that different. Um, we're in a very analogous stage. 
We're trying to make an educated guess about what comes next. Of course, historically, this is not what happened with the pions, as, as Nima pointed out. You know, at the time we were discovering the pions and measuring their interactions, we were already seeing the higher dimension operators and so on, and the interactions with heavier states, like the, the, the proton and the neutron, that were already telling us what the new physics scale was. So we were not in this situation. But had we not been lucky enough to have stable baryons, and had we, of course, the universe would look very different. What, I'm, what I mean by we would be very different, but had we been in, the, in a situation where we didn't have stable baryons and we had just built an accelerator that can produce pions and nothing else, that is what we would have had to work with. That's, that's where we would have been. Yep. Right. Uh, yes, you can. You, um, well, you cannot even calculate it within the EFT containing the pions. So, but when you go to the when you go to the next level, which has the rho meson and the a, it's actually the a one meson and the rho meson are the important guys and the photon. You can calculate it in whatever scheme you want, and you will get uh, five MeV. So it's not calculable. It's not physical to even ask. What is, this, what is this correction in the EFT? It's like in the standard model asking what the origin of the Higgs mass is, what, what the correction to the Higgs mass are. You just got some renormalizable theory, you absorb things into counter terms. But that would have been the a absolutely wrong approach in this hypothetical universe, because you're trying to guess at what, uh, uh, what's coming on. And, and that was option C, right? Um, within the EFT, you cannot calculate uh, uh, the origin of the parameters within the EFT themselves. You have to ask of the next level, or you just give up and, you know, join industry or something like this. Okay, so, where are we with the Higgs? By the way, I, I think this is a sort of, philosophically I find this very important. You know, people discuss um, renormalizability and, and, um, and uh, whether or not we should be asking what the microscopic origins of the Higgs mass are and things like this. To me, I mean, of course it's different for every, everybody, but for me, this is really our job. Right? And if you look at this historical picture, it's been the job of theorists to stare at the effective field theory that we're working with and try and understand, ask questions, not um, can I measure that parameter in an experiment, but why is that parameter the value that it is? Where does it come from? What is it telling us about the next energy scale? What is it telling us about the fundamental laws of nature? And that's really where, what the hierarchy problem is. People don't work on the hierarchy problem um, because they like to do one loop diagrams in dim reg with a loop of top quarks and, and, uh, and stare, you know, stare, stare at, uh, at these diagrams. People work on the hierarchy problem because this is our best uh, 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 chance at figuring out what the, the, the next layer of fundamental physics is. And it could be telling us something really, really fundamental um, about nature. So where are we with, with, with uh, the Higgs? So the Higgs is very analogous to this hypothetical world. So we have, um, for example, now we have uh, the gauge interactions, you know, G, sorry, G prime B. I'm not putting in factors of two and things like this. Uh, we have things like the, the Yukawa interactions as well, lambda top, Higgs, uh, uh, Q, U, C, things like this. So we're very much analogous to this hypothetical world where we've just discovered the pions. Um, and so we can pr perform an exact, uh, a very similar calculation. So we have the observed Higgs mass squared, you know, 125 GeV uh, in the, the, the broken phase, for example. We can relate that through the self-coupling to uh, the Higgs mass squared in the, um, the unbroken theory. It's just a factor of two different. Um, and, and we see that, that what, what is the, the, the effective theory that we're working with telling us? It's telling us that this is um, coming from some bare Higgs mass squared which presumably would be calculable within the, the effective theory, just like for the pions. You know, the pions had this UV contribution to their mass, which I didn't tell you about, which uh, comes about because of the quark masses, and that is also calculable. So you can take the, 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 the UV theory going even beyond the rows and the, and, uh, uh, um, the etas and all that sort of stuff, and there's a UV contribution to the pion mass, which has its origin in the, the quark masses, and you can just calculate what we would in the, the EFT sort of think of as being like a bare mass. Similarly here, um, there should be some UV contribution, 
Plus, within the, the EFT alone, we see there should be sort of corrections, just like with the pions, that, again, we have no idea what the precise numerical coefficient would be, but we expect they should be there, where this is the scale of, of, the, of, of the next level of new physics. Um, and this is exactly, you know, there's a G prime as well. Uh, this is exactly uh, analogous to that uh, hypothetical pion world we were living in. Um, it's got lambda top squared. Um, plus corrections now here, which, uh, which would uh, naively, uh, sorry, interactions here, which naively give us corrections that scale like this. And we don't know if the cutoff is the same, the scale of new physics in both sectors, the gauge and the, the, the quark sector is the same. So this is just, just analogous. Now, um, the reason I write these, these terms is just the same reason that I wrote them for the pions. There's no, si the, what, there's no symmetry within the effective field theory that forbids these terms from being here. Of course, if we set the gauge couplings to zero and the Yukawa couplings to zero, we would um, uh, uh, um, recover an approximate shift symmetry that we could tell you that this, this mass squared could be small or even uh, zero if the Higgs mass were, were zero. But within the effective field theory, we've got to just take what we're given, just like with the pions. We've got gauge interactions. They break any symmetries that could have forbidden corrections that depend on the, the UV scale of, of physics. And uh, similarly here. Sorry? Yep. Why isn't there a term from the Higgs self interaction? Ah, there is. There is, yes. Yes, there's nothing. Uh, It's got a lambda h squared, yes. Exactly. And we'll see when we get to the twin Higgs, you'll see that this, uh, this term can be important. OK, so, so now going by analogy with the pions, we're trying to guess about what comes next. We're being honest about what we know. What we know is what is experiment is measured. We're not trying to, you know, we're avoiding hubris by trying to claim that we know, uh, now that we've measured the standard model weight parameters, we know physics uh, to arbitrarily high uh, energy scales. And there are a bunch of, of, of possibilities. You could have that these guys, um, uh, you know, g squared over 4 pi squared, lambda squared, etc., are tuned together. To give a small mass. Okay, this is just like in the case of the pions. We could have, in principle, tuned the UV contributions to the, the pion mass coming from the quarks against, um, uh, well, no, we, in that case, we couldn't have actually done it. But without, within the, within, not in terms of the quarks, but you could have imagined that there was some other UV completion, which was not QCD, where there are different con UV contributions to the charged pion and neutral pion mass that are just exactly tuned to cancel the sort of contributions you get from the gauge interactions. Um, you could have that... Uh, the second scenario, which is that lambda in the top sector at least is less than about 400 GeV. Um, this is just saturating that this would come out at uh, the observed Higgs mass. Or the, the, the possibility that, that the Higgs mass squared is never calculable. I.e that there will never be another step where we can go in this direction and actually calculate the, the parameters of the standard model from some more fundamental theory. Um, now, you would expect maybe nature does is going to do what it did for the pions. We can't tell, but broadly speaking, my, my perspective on these three things is that, well, this is sort of very, bo C is very boring and scientifically very cardly. It's just saying, uh, it, if, if, you, if, if you commit to this hypothesis, you're bit essentially saying that you're giving up on trying to understand nature, which is, yep. Yes, right. So, that, so, exactly, so it requires an enormous coincidence. It's a scale-dependent thing such that if you start in the UV theory and you RG flow all the way down. So just like in, in, for the pions, you know, if you start with QCD, you've got the QCD gauge coupling, the, the quark masses things like this in URG flow, um, uh, those couplings all the way down, and you can put this theory on the lattice and then derive the pion mass and things like this. And if you wanted that tuning to occur, that, um, uh, there, that means there would have been a conspiracy that, isn't d necess that is, doesn't look like a tuning necessarily, although it's hidden in there, in the UV at some, at some RG scale. It may not, not look like there's some delicate cancellation, but there's some little bit left over.
such that by the time you hit the IR, by the time you hit the EFT, you get this accident. And that's exactly what this would require. It's not, this is why I hate, you see I'm not writing loop diagrams, because this is not a statement about loop diagrams and things like this. This is a statement about the structure of, the, of effective field theories. And, and exactly, you would need, this can, this, for this to be true, you need the conspiracy in the UV to happen in the UV in a very bizarre way. Not, th not that you start at some scale with a small Higgs mass. You start at some scale with a big Higgs mass that is just right, such that by the time that you go the whole way down, it ends up uh, being small. That's a really good question. Yep. Sir, what's the difference between A and C? To me, that's, so, sorry, actually, what do you mean by C? Mm. So C would, be, would say that there is no next microscopic, for example. I mean, I, I don't even really know what I mean by C, but it's because it's so unpalatable to me. I don't, I don't know what it really means, but it means that there's no next microscopic layer from which you can derive the pr parameters of the standard model. So here, if there's some tuning, and tunings do happen in nature, where the next layer um, has some, some happy coincidence between parameters such that things turn out to be uh, 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 smaller than you expect by, say, some, uh, by 10% or, you know, at, at the 10% level or something like that. So here, this statement is that there is some microscopic theory, some microscopic next layer, where we can go in this direction and actually calculate the Higgs mass. You know, we could discover this theory in principle, build an accelerator, discover it, measure all its parameters and calculate the Higgs mass. But when we measure those parameters, we'd see that there's just some bizarre coincidence between the parameters such that all of the contributions to the Higgs mass happen to cancel out such that when you get to the EFT scale, it's small. This is saying that that, that that next microscopic theory is not even there, that somehow we hit nothing in the UV. Sorry, you mean, then for C, it means that the cancellation is purely coincidental? There's no cancellation. It's, it doesn't even make sense to ask what, you know, what the calculable value of the Higgs mass is. There's, there's nothing else. So you cannot, all you can say is, the only thing I can do is measure this by experiment. Exactly. It's, it's very hard to wrap your head around it, right? Uh, and this is what you would do. Say you, just, say you just say, well, it's the standard model, and that's the standard model, and that's the end of the story. From within the standard model, you can never ask what the value of the Higgs mass is. You can just take it from experiment. So that's, that's essentially what this is sort of saying, that it's just an input, and we can never ask where it comes from. Sure, but we know that from the EFT point of view, we can't compute the corrections from, from high order, uh, the high order corrections. So you're saying essentially C means that the EFT breaks? No, no. Uh, it's, it's the opposite. It's, it's, it's C is sort of like this, the EFT is everything. So, so you, can't, you can't, so if I give you QED, just a, an electron and a photon, why is the value of the, the electromagnetic coupling what it is? You can't ask it within the EFT. You can calculate higher order corrections to various, various things, but in the end of the day, you have to perform some experiment to fix that coupling at some scale and then leave it at that. And that's what you would be saying here if, if, you, if you adopt this approach. You just say, well, I'm never going to ask where it comes from. I'm just going to measure it and set it. And when I do my you know, three loop electroweak calculations, I'm just going to make sure that I choose my, my bare coupling such that there's a pole 125 GeV and, uh, and leave it at that. But what we're trying to do here is follow, follow uh, 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 progress of the past, which is str to study the EFT, to, to, to realize we're working within an EFT and try and guess at what comes next. Sorry, I'm still a bit confused, but even in A, you need to, you are considering the correction and the relative size between the correction and the bare terms. For the bare terms, it's the free parameter. No, 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 no. This is so. This is that. These are these are. You calculate these within the next microscopic theory. Oh, 
are what they are. You have to measure them and experiment. You can't get them from anywhere else. And so, um, <coughs> so that's it. That, that, so that's, 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 I think, what you're imagining by deep, right? It's yep. just a parameter forever. And we'll yep. never find the deep yep. If there was no gravity, that's probably what we would have thought, right? You wouldn't have said the Ibn should be implanted because there is no reason to think, right, this is the fundamental scale, right? I mean, Right, but it's, it goes beyond that. I mean, um, for example, with this story with the pions, right, uh, gravity doesn't play a role, right? And so we're just trying to, I, I think sometimes, I know this is just per purely personal perspective, so, so, so you, uh, you know, should assess uh, uh, what you think of, of what I'm about to say on, on your own terms, but I think we make too big of a deal about gravity because we're trying to jump really, really far into the UV, really, really far. And yet, all of the time, we've been making these little leaps of a decade or so. And I think we should be a little bit more honest with ourselves about th the current stage of physics. This is my perspective, and it's not necessarily the same as other uh, perspectives f shared by, by much smarter people than myself. But I think we need to be a little bit honest about what we know and what we don't know and what stage of, of uh, this story that we, we believe we're at. Also, it would never be M Planck anyway. That's M Planck isn't a mass scale. There would have to be some coupling squared times M Planck squared would be the Higgs mass correction. Yep. So A is saying that at the weak scale, all these different parameters are tuned. Um, no, no, it's saying that the parameters within the microscopic theory are tuned such that the final answer comes out to be small. But then could you try to make a measurement of the Higgs mass at a higher scale and see that it's not tuned anymore? Well, yeah, but so to really though, if you, if you were to think about, so I, I want to keep pushing on this analogy with the pion. Um, if there had been some tuning in the UV theory with the pions, you may discover that tuning in terms of the microscopic parameters at an energy scale where it doesn't even make sense to say the word pion. It's a, 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 you know, where you have quarks and gluons and things like this. So you know, the, within that effective theory, we have at that energy, at the EFT energy scale, we have pions. And we talk about pions, and we can make guesses about the next energy scale, whereas um, <coughs> once you hit that net en next energy scale, it may, not be it may not be necessarily correct to even think about pions. And that could be the case here. There's just some UV theory where we, ha where we can calculate these parameters so we can make these steps that we've done in the past. And um, <coughs> in that theory, we would have to find, you know, maybe it's strongly coupled and we have to put it on the lattice. We would find that the quark masses in that theory and the couplings and so on are tuned such that there's all of these different microscopic uh, contributions to the Higgs mass, um, such that when you put it on the lattice and you calculate and uh, you retrieve the parameters of the, the low energy theory, you see that the Higgs mass is lighter than you would have expected given the ver scale of these various contributions. Yep. Uh, so, uh, I want to come back to a previous question. Yes. So, is the problem here really C or A, like point C or point A? Because my point is that you're not asking this question about, let's say, the bottom mass. You're asking this question about the Higgs mass because right. You know that given the symmetries of your theory, the bottom mass is the number is fine, yep. but then the, it's the next set of question where the number comes from. Yes. Here the question is that the number itself is not very sensible given the symmetries of the theory. Because I, I, you yes. Can question no, no, no. I totally yes. So, 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 you're you're absolutely right in the sense that the the bottom mass is totally different to the Higgs because right. with the bottom we have chiral symmetry, and so we can under. Still, it's an input. It's an input. Well, you don't know, no, but you, can, this, you could ask these two, thing, these two questions in a similar way for the bottom. You could say, well, in maybe the bottom mass, the origin of the bottom Yukawa can never be understood. So flavor physicists want to understand the origin of the bottom Yukawa, for example, they, they, or model builders at least. They, they really want to say, well, there's all of, look, and not just the bottom, they want to, there's clear structure in, uh, in the quark and lepton mass Yukawas. Uh, which leads to their masses, and also in the in the, uh, the CKM matrix, you'd have to be insane not to stare at those numbers, and uh, and and or if you you'd have to be insane to stare at those numbers and say, well, there's no pattern here. There's clear hierarchies um, there. So flavor physicists say, well, model builders say, well, look, there's there's evidence for something here. There's some UV completion. There's some next story that tells us the origin of this structure, right? So they they are they're in 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 a camp where they don't want to say this. You could alternatively say, well, the core Q-cows just are what they are. We can never explain their origin. And uh, we just have to take them from experiment and forget about it. Um, but that's a very sort of, in my opinion, very unscientific and, and 
and uh, um, uh, I think unsatisfying uh, hypothesis, especially because you can net, you, you only know by a building experiment and knowing. So, but you could ask these sorts of questions about other parameters in the standard model. But what you're emphasizing, which is absolutely correct, is that so by the, with the Higgs sector, it's hitting us in the face because we've got no symmetries. At least with the bottom Yukawa, we have a, the chiral symmetry, which tells us that, well, if there's some small parameter in whatever that microscopic layer is um, that breaks the chiral symmetry, and that parameter is, happens to be small, then in the effective theory, we see the remnants of that, s that small symmetry breaking as being a small breaking of the chiral symmetry in the effective theory. So we have a small-ish, I mean, it's only 1 over 30 or something, but a small-ish bottom Yukawa. That isn't true for the Higgs because of these things. We have no symmetries within the effective theory. If we, if we had discovered an effective theory where these were small, then, then appropriately we would have to scale up our expectations for where new physics might be because we'd have some approximate symmetries to work with. But the fact that in natural units this is an order one number is telling us that even within the effective theory, there's no symmetries lying around to, to help us understand why the Higgs mass could be small. So there's no reason then that in the next layer that there would be some, some, some magic where suddenly there is a symmetry that keeps it small. Um, and we will see this when we come to, to uh, uh, composite Higgs models. It really hits us in the face there. That was really uh, an excellent point. Can I make a comment about yep. C? Uh, C is actually exactly what happens in condensed matter physics. Um, and C is what happens. Uh, C is essentially where the language of the word fine tuning comes from historically. Uh, imagine that you're in a system that I don't want to, anyway, I don't want, yeah. But the, 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 the analog is, is in the discussions about the landscape and so yes. on. Oh, no, I will come to that. It's not yes. literally computable in our world, right? Yes. It's, uh, maybe there's a distribution, maybe there's something else, but that's the sort of analog. So C actually happens. Uh, yes. So C, C is where the, the picture of fine-tuning, the words for fine-tuning come from to begin with in condensed matter systems, yes. where the parameters are literally not calculable in the system that you're talking yes. about, but are determined from the outside. Yes, and this, I just want, want to make a slight comment on that. So, so Neem is saying that in, in condensed matter, he's not saying that you can't do this, but he's saying that the, the, essentially the fine-tuning will persist. So imagine you're, you're, you're in a superconductor at the superconducting phase transition, and you say, oh, I've got this scalar that's got a really, really small mass, and then you do your experiment in that superconductor to, um, to, to discover the microscopic physics, and you would discover that there's the physics of phonons, and, and, and uh, uh, Cooper pairs and all of these sorts of things. But you'd say, well, hang on, still, one of these parameters has been chosen. In this case, it would be the temperature. One of the, these parameters has been chosen, even in the microscopic theory, just so that when I hit the EFT, this scalar mass is small, right? Um, so that scalar mass is calculable in, the, in this sense. It is calculable from the more microscopic theories. You can go in this direction. But you're finding as you go to that next microscopic scale that indeed there has been a tuning that you cannot explain from within the system itself. Or that I would say it remains a parameter. Yeah. So you know the full microscopic theory and it remains a parameter of the microscopic theory yeah. that's not controlled by microphysics in your world. Yeah. Okay. In that case, it's controlled by the coupling of your world to some thermal bath on the outside and the term experimentalist who has their fingers on the dial. Yeah. Can, uh, do what <coughs> Well, I mean, in some sense, it's the most profound yeah, I mean, it, it possibility. Be, 
Awesome. Okay. So, are there any more questions before I move on for 15 minutes to, to uh, um, approaches? Nope. Okay. So, um, there's some sort of radical approaches that I've not mentioned um, amongst, well, I guess C is related to, to the landscape, which I will briefly mention. But there's some things that are discussed, which I would like to discuss briefly, um, or that I think would be interesting in the future, but they're not uh, necessarily new, they're not even necessarily workable, but I think they're worth thinking about. Um, I call them sort of unestablished or, or, or uh, marginal ideas. So the first is, or difficult ones, the first is scale invariance. So as was pointed out in a question earlier, if I stare at the pion, the pion interaction with the photons, that interaction itself is, is uh, scale invariant. So there is a symmetry, and by scale symmetry I mean something where you rescale each coordinate by some constant parameter, let's call it alpha, and you scale each, rescale each scalar field by one over alpha, and then um, the theory has this, this uh, 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 appears to have this scale symmetry. So you could say, well, what about, the, like, with the pions, there should have been no correction to the charge pion to, to neutral pion mass splitting because E, the electromagnetic gauge coupling, is dimensionless. And so there's a scale symmetry, an approximate scale symmetry in this theory, um, and that's only broken by, by the, 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 the pion mass terms themselves. Um, so why are we worrying about this? Of course, this is assuming you haven't managed to uh, discover the higher... higher uh, uh, um, order interactions of the, of the pions. The, this didn't work for the pions, and the reason it didn't work for the pions was because there was a scale. The reason is that you know we we have uh, e squared over four pi ish squared. So this is, that's called delta m squared, um, lambda squared, and the, the fact is that there was a scale of new physics which was lambda. In this case, it's the, 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 the mass of the, the rho meson. So <coughs> for if, there, if that theory of pions was all there ever was, it's sort of, in some sense, almost uh, like this. It's sort of saying that there's a UV boundary condition, in a sense. If, if that theory of pions was all there ever was, and there was no uh, 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 additional scales, then you could say, well, there shouldn't be a, a, uh, a, a big correction to the charge pion to neutral pion mass splitting because there's no uh, theory within, no parameter other than the mass themselves within the EFT, which breaks scale symmetry, so there cannot be corrections because any corrections require a scale, but there was a scale. And so there are attempts to do this um, uh, for the Higgs because, for example, if you stare at these couplings, they also uh, respect a scale symmetry. So if you can embed the, th the, the, the standard model in a theory uh, which is scale invariant, then there's a hope that you could explain why the Higgs mass is, uh, is small because essentially what you're saying is these terms aren't there because there is no UV uh, uh, scale in the first place. Now this might sound radical. It's sort of almost a little bit related to this it's, and it's almost related to, to sort of a boundary value pro problem. But I sort of think it's still interesting. People work on this. Some people are disparaging. Some people are, are excited. Um, I think it's, it's very interesting to honestly try to embed the standard model into a scale invariant theory. But this requires a lot. This means that that you have to go all the way up through the, the Planck scale and um, worry about things like the Landau pole for hypercharge, which is way, way above the Planck scale, and try and embed this theory into something that, that is essentially already UV complete, which means that you can go arbitrarily to arbitrarily high energies and everything remains, uh, remains sort of calculable. It doesn't give you necessarily a handle on the origin of the Higgs mass, but you can even try to play games where uh, uh, quantum breaking of scale symmetry essentially leads to the Higgs mass using Coleman-Weinberg type arguments. So I think it's interesting. I don't work on it, but I think it's interesting. But it's really, really ambitious, um, and it requires um, uh, 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 an awful lot of very interesting things to happen in the UV, and it's hard to do it honestly. Um, you can be less honest and bury this into, and forget about the UV, and just study the standard model itself, in which case then you do have just the standard model and it does have an approximate scale symmetry apart, to, apart from, from uh, uh, RG evolution. Um, but then you're sort of burying this into some boundary value problem because you run the standard model all the way up to, for example, nearest the Planck scale or something like that, or wherever quantum gravity kicks in. Um, and you require that at that energy scale, 
you have uh, uh, no contribution to, to the Higgs mass, for example. I think it behooves the, the, the theorist then to explain where that boundary condition comes from because you clearly have evidence for, for uh, uh, physics above that energy scale. So some people are disparaging, some people are excited. I, I'm on the fence, but I think it's interesting. Another possibility is to break QFT. This is something that I would, uh, I would uh, love to happen. Um, but I don't know how to do it. There, there are sort of attempts and examples, but the, 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 this is like essentially br breaking the Wilsonian logic, uh, the Wilsonian picture. Because this picture of, of um, being able to flow from, from, from right to left and calculate in the IR, calculate the IR uh, 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 um, properties from the UV story, so take a microscopic theory and flow to longer and longer distance scales, it's more than, it's a lot more than just the qualitative sort of hand-waving uh, this almost chronological arguments I gave earlier. It's really, it, it stands on a very firm basis that has its origins essentially in the operator product expansion, which is um, <coughs> looking at how we can integrate out or factor out physics on different length scales. And that is deeply rooted in the structure of, of QFT in things like causality, unitarity, uh, even things like cluster decomposition and so on. All of Weinberg volume one, essentially. And not not RG, but the origins of Q QFT, you know, all, all the sort of fundamental principles that go into it. So there's a hope. Imagine we can violate unitarity or violate causality. Sometimes in those theories, it's not even hard to tell which it is that you're, you're violating, but you're violating something. Um, then we could hope that we completely throw this uh, uh, Wilsonian logic out the window. In a sense that in, in, a, in a theory like this, you would not be able to factorize lengths, physics on different length scales in the way that we're comfortable with doing so. You would have, one way of saying it is you'd have mixing between physics in the UV and the IR, physics, microscopic physics and, and physics in the effective field theory. I think this is a very exciting possibility, but there's, at the moment there's still not really any, any um, uh, convincing attempt, but I really hope uh, someone finds a way to do it. There's an example that you might <coughs> want to Google or look up, which is Lee Wick type theories. This is, this is an example where you get... Um, your naive expectations go out the window because you have ghosts and ghosts violate causality. And what happens is that the propagator as a function of P squared in a theory like this um, has the usual behavior um, minus a pole with the wrong sign residue. So this is telling you you're going to violate something like causality at some stage. Um, and this cause big M squared where, where big M could be some, some microscopic uh, uh, energy scale, say a TeV or above. Yep. Ah, so, so the, the problem is that you violate causality. You will have, you will find in your theory states which have poles with the wrong residue. So you can, when you go, so, so, so indeed, so, so say I integrate out this, this state here with, with the, the wrong sign residue, I will find in the IR theory a, a, a four derivative term, kinetic term with the, uh, an unexpected sign. But that, that ghost is a ghost. Yeah, no, that's, that's this. That's, so the cancellation you're talking about is this guy here. So as you go to high P squared, you're, you're, you're finding this is much softer uh, uh, behavior with P squared than you expect because at high P squared, these scales are, are irrelevant. And this term essentially cancels this term. But you have a ghost. You have a state with a wrong sign pole. Now, that not, it may not even be. So in the Lee Wick theories, that's a state. This could be a whole host of states. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a pole. It could be a wrong sign, essentially branch cut and things like this. But you have to have something that's violating causality at a microscopic scale. Within the IR theory, you don't see, you, you get suspicious that something's wrong. You start to see wacky uh, uh, higher derivative terms with an unexpected sign. There's nothing wrong with higher derivative terms, by the way, within an EFT. They're totally generic. Uh, but, um, but you get higher derivative terms with the, the opposite sign from what you expect. 
But within that theory alone, you may not see on the distance scales you're working at um, and any uh, a clear, although you could probably find some sort of on some fixed field background or something, you could probably find some evidence for causality violation or something like this. But for sure, you're going to have to hit at some point um, some weird stuff going on in the UV, which may look to you like causality violation or unit unitarity violation. Ghosts are, ghosts are a problem. They're, they're not, uh, we can't uh, uh, bury them under the, under the carpet. No, exactly. Yeah. But but what happens is weird, right? It's weird, but it's not. Uh, yep. yeah, it's not breaking the rule. We, um, I think people who hope to break the Wilsonian picture hope to do it not in such a stupid way. Right. No. Exactly. Well. No. Exactly. And, and si it's similarly. Right. Yes. I mean, this is. So this is, the, this is the only example of a UV completion that I know of where I, I can even sort of start to talk about what's going wrong. Uh, but no, it is stupid and it's, and it's, and it's old. It's interesting, but uh, it doesn't work because of the ghosts. Yep. I mean, I don't know. I, d I mean, I don't know what I would call, call it, say that it's breaking, because when you're, when you're working in terms of, of analyticity properties, I've, well, at least I find it hard to identify if I talk about things like unitarity and, and causality, which has gone wrong. Uh, but yes. Yes, right. So no, no. This is saying that there is no UV scale. So a com in a composite Higgs model, you hit the sc compositeness scale, and everything's calculable. This is this is the opposite. This is saying there is no UV scale. There's no. There's just nothing. There's no new. Th this is saying. Let me put it a bit more precisely. This is saying that there's above. That saying that all of the poles of nature, poles and branch cuts, we've already discovered. That's what it's saying. There's no new states. Um, I mean, the A gravity stuff has tried to do parts of this, um, and the guys who do the Coleman Weinberg thing for the weak scale have definitely done dark matter and things like this. But still, I mean, access going going beyond the Planck scale is hard, right? You're always hitting to get. It I mean, they are sort of tied together, right? If you try to do something like this for the Planck scale, you end up, um, you know, if you try to UV complete. Gravity in a normal sort of not QFT-ish way, but in a causal unitary style. I don't even know what I'm saying about causal. But if you if you if you 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 um, try to UV complete it, obeying the usual sort of postulates of quantum mechanics, um, then you typically need to require states, right? We've seen this uh, uh, many times. So if you try to do it without having any new states, you typically have to do something like this. You know, end up with some sort of ghosts in the theory or something like this, which is going to tame the growth of scattering amplitudes. Um, so they sort of end up uh, uh, being tied together if you really try to attack um, uh, quantum gravity in that way. But there are less ambitious ones that do try to say, well, forget about quantum gravity, and we just want to generate all our scales in a sort of coleman weinberg -y style way. And then people can do things like uh, dark matter baryogenesis. I'm not sure, but definitely dark matter. At the weak scale. No, I mean, I haven't worked on it, but, but, but if you try to embed it in a conformal theory, you're still going to have states, right? I mean, that sort of... No, but you want all the states. But that, I mean, I think in this whole picture, it's, it's fine to imagine that sort of one scale coming down, right. maybe it's some form of magic, maybe it's some something. But you want, you want the theory to have essentially one scale, that scale is the weak scale, and everything is fine. But if yes. otherwise, 
Yes. And trying to do that with hypercharge, yes. it's, a, it's a complete mess. Yes. It's a massive mess. Yes. And every way I tried to do it, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it without pushing everything to But there's, yeah, there's been some interesting progress in the sense that, yeah, I'm not sure where it's going. Uh, this is the, that, those sort of approaches, I think, yeah. that you're alluding to are, look very mechanical, right? You're essentially cancelling beta functions by adding junk all the time, right? But um, there are ones that, that use, um, you know, cancellations between, now, between gauge, Yukawa, and scalars and things like this, right? There's this stuff that... Um, without changing the gauge group? Without I mean, changing the gauge group, I think. Be, I think that's where the scalars come in or something. I can't remember. Oh, you add extra scalars? You add scalars. Oh, right. So... And they have mass around the weak scale, and gauge, and Yukawa, and you know th th it isn't it, it isn't an enormous <coughs> mass. Uh, no, you're right. Yes, it has to be embedded in, in a gut at some point. Yes. He did. Um, yes. Yeah, you typically like Paddy Salamat or something. So. Yes. Um, and then you really screwed with SDMC. Like, so I, I didn't know any way of doing it without pushing the scale to the Yes. Level. Or praying to flavor somehow. You know, but uh, yes. Um, okay. And the other one is, uh, is, is breaking calculability, which alludes to what Nemo was saying about point C. Um, but this is going to put a bit of flesh on it, but actually we've already discussed it, so I don't need to discuss it long. Which is, um, if you embed into a theory where uh, isn't calculable or in some sense unique, And a, 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 an example of this would be the landscape, right? Where now the, you're, you're addressing the, the problem by saying, well, there um, are many, many, the, 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 the universe contains uh, many, many different standard models, standard model-like vacua. There are loads and loads of different vacua. And we've just landed in one of those vacua, which um, uh, uh, has the properties that we are observing. And it just so happens that in, in that vacuum, it could be related to anthropics. It could be, uh, it could not. But uh, it just so happens that in that vacuum, there are, from a UV perspective, uh, what may look like f delicate cancellations. But it turns out that those that those uh, 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 delicate cancellations are sort of to be expected because to land in that particular vacuum, there may be other pressures that uh, that uh, are making that vacuum for us. Um, uh, uh, more likely than the uh, than the, the the other vacuo we could have been in. Um, okay, so those are the sort of, and I've I've run out of time, so that's I guess I should finish there. But those are sort of that's uh, sort of oldish um, ideas for the weak scale and a sort of summary of of the hierarchy problem the way I see it, um, which is not unique. People people view it in different ways. Um, and a bit of a flavor of the things that, that, that might sort of work but don't quite work. And in the next lectures, we're going to go to, to uh, variants of traditional approaches, which are new in a sense that they, 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 they sort of riff on the ideas of the past but with new ingredients. And these, these include things like the Twin Higgs model. And then in the, the, the lecture after that, I want to discuss um, even more interesting approaches which bring uh, cosmological dynamics, or in my opinion, more interesting approaches which bring cosmological dynamics into the story and say, well, that um, this whole story of symmetries and calculability and so on um, has forgotten about one, one important aspect, which is dynamics, that we live in a universe that is evolving. And um, that can perhaps give us a, a view onto um, uh, 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 puzzles about uh, the, the next microscopic uh, 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 scales or, or new states that may exist beyond the standard model. I'll finish there. Any more questions?
Right. So, so indeed, so say, say you have the landscape and you could calculate all of string theory, for example, or whatever the UV completion is, then indeed you'd be able to say, well, look, there is a vacuum with these properties, at least. But the problem is that that vacuum um, is just one of many, many, many. So it's not telling you why we're in that vacuum. You have to then appeal to other uh, questions like anthropics, which for the weak scale are on not the same sort of solid grounding that we have, you know, when we, when we use anthropics to discuss um, the cosmological constant, the argument is very, very strong because there really is this anthropic boundary. Anthropics as applied to the weak scale has not been as successful. So uh, uh, in the sense that there's no sort of clear cut uh, 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 explanation that you could, you know, uh, explain to a relative very easily, whereas with anthropics for the cosmological constant you can. So, so indeed there may be, if we could really calculate all of the possible vacuum that could exist, and if they're finite, which they may be in a certain sense, or at least finite up to some parameter deformations, then you could indeed discover that there is a vacuum with these properties where this is calculable in that sense, but then there's a next step of, of the question. Was there another question? Were you, yeah? Just, uh, I know that, um, not historically, but like popularly, people usually think about land atop. Is there like a basic reason why you should think that specific, I mean, that this is the one where I expect to see the new physics and not, you know, why not the G term, why not the lambda right. term, why not all quarks are fundamental and specifically the electric, I mean, I know people usually start from the top. Is there like... Yes, no, that's a great question. So, yeah, so, so the intuition is like the argument I used for the pions where this is just the biggest term. So this scale has to be the smallest, like 400 GeV. Um, but you know, I was I was I was careful to put lambda t top, lambda h, and, and I should call this lambda gauge here, because indeed we don't. These sectors may look very different in the UV, and perhaps um, the leading corrections are actually coming from the gauge sector. And there's some wacko composite dynamics, like exactly like you say, there's some compositeness perhaps in the gauge sector, and that the the fermion sector is different. So we have to think about what we mean by this rough estimate in that 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 way. But yeah, the main reason is that this is, appear this is, by this basic argument, this is the lowest scale. So we think that that's probably where um, new states should show up first. But uh, uh, I'm not going to claim with certainty that that's where, where it should show up first. 